So, we made it through the end of uh, Genesis chapter 4 last week, but I want to go back in and just reread the last couple of verses. It says in chapter 4, verse 25, Then Adam knew his wife again, and she bore him a son, and named his name Seth. For she said, For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. So we get to the end of this looking at Cain's line, and then we kind of change horses and we get back on Adam's line. You know, the maybe if you would, the blessed line or something, you know, not the, not the terrible sinner line, although all of us are sinners, right? And... Uh, and Adam knows his wife again. I don't think this is just the third time he's known her. You know, this is one of those things. And she has a son. And, and she knows something about this son. This one's an appointed one. This one has a purpose, has a calling. This, there's something special about this one. So she names him appointed, Seth. And uh, then it says that... Um, The days of Adam were, we're going to read this in the next chapter, they were 800 years after they had Seth. 800 years, you know. And they had sons and daughters. So, so how old is Adam and Eve now? When did they start having kids? When were Cain and Abel born? And, and how long has it been since then to Seth? And, you know, I, I love to think about that. You know, was, was uh, Eve just one or two years old when she had her first kid. And that's a fun picture because she was created a fully adult human, you know. So how old was she and all of that stuff. And, and how long has it been, you know, because this is 130 years or something after. And so really interesting. And she knows that this one has this special calling. This one's something to do with that promise in Genesis 3-5, you know, that I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. You know, Seth is in that lineage, in that line. And then Seth has a son. How long does that take, you know? And the phrase, and men began to call on the name of the Lord at that time. And I've heard that preached on in a very negative sense. But Seth's name means uh, sorry, I've lost my clue. Seth, Seth's name means appointed. Enosh, his son's name um, means mortal or frail. Their understanding that this mortal life, you know, this fallen life, there's some frailties to life, you know. People are breaking bones and getting in accidents and maybe dying and, you know, all of this stuff is going on. And they're beginning to understand this mortality and it's hard. But People begin to call on the name of the Lord. I believe this is good. I believe this is a revival happening. This is an awakening happening. This is something's going on between them and the Lord, and they're kind of getting back to the Lord because it's been hundreds of years since creation, since God was actively involved, since all of this stuff. And... Uh, we're going to walk through these days up until the days of Noah, and there are some dark things happening in those days. And it says in chapter 5, verse 1, This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in his likeness, made him in the likeness of God. Um, Adam, of course, his name means man. So you're going to read that several times. You know, it, it's the children of men. That's the children of Adam. It, it's, it's this idea, you know. And then it says, And he created them, male and female, he created them, and he called them mankind, man, Adam. He called them that. In the day they were 
created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son. And he, in his own likeness and in his image, and he named him Seth. Interesting now, this word, Adam lived 130 years. That word lived is never found in Canaan's genealogy. I don't know if it's on purpose. I don't know if there's some picture in there that we're supposed to notice. But that, that word alive, living, not in Canaan's line. Suddenly we get it back into Adam's line and here's this life. Here's this life. It's interesting. He's going to live 130 years, and we're going to get only the essential names in this genealogy, in this listing of the Messiah's line. <laughs> we're going to find all of them have other sons and daughters that remain unnamed. So 130 years, he begets a son, notice this, in his own likeness. How was Adam created? Oh yeah, in God's likeness. An image, right? Mm -hmm. And now the fall happens. How does Adam create humankind? In his fallen image and likeness. That's how we get on, you know. He's going to be fallen just like dad was fallen. You're fallen just like your dad was fallen. All the way back to Adam, you know. All of that stuff. Some key points in these verses. And Adam lives... 930 years total. And we're going to go through Seth and Enosh and Canaan and Mahaliel and Jared and Enoch and Methuselah and Lamech. And Adam is going to live 55 years into Lamech's life. This great, 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 you know, six great grandkids life. 55 years into his life. He lives within 28 years of Noah being born. You ever scratch your head about that? I mean, imagine the earth. It's filled with millions of people by that point. What would, have been, what would it have been like to speak to great, 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 great grandpa Noah or, or, or Adam? What was it like? What was it like in the garden? What was it like to walk with God? How come we lost that? What happened there? You know, and here's Adam. Mean, he has to explain it to every generation. Well, you know, uh, we had a little incident at the house, you know. And uh, what was it like to walk in perfection? What's it been like since then? What's the differences? You know, all of these questions. I, I would have a lot of questions. For that. Adam is slowly dying. Satan's been proved a liar. You shall not surely die when you eat that fruit. Oh, good. That, that turned out to be a lie, you know. It says in verse 4, And after he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. How many? Now, now think about this. You know, if they started having kids right away, so... Two or three years, they start having kids. So they have Canaan, they have Abel, they have other kids, and then 130 years later, they're still producing kids. Still, 130 years later, they have Seth, and then they still have more sons and daughters. How many kids did they put out? How? It's I I wonder about that. Verse five. So all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Here we go. And he died. Here's, here's the devastation. Here's the fall. You know? Evidence of the fall. How do we know it happened? Because you and I were going to die. Unless the Lord comes and gets us. You know? We're going to die. Death is Universal comes for everyone. I mean, there's only two exceptions in the entire history of the world. Two exceptions. We're going to read about one of those today, but it's one for one. You know, war doesn't cause death rate to go up. Cancer doesn't cause the death rate to go up. 
your your disease that we're all worried about does not cause the death rate to go up. Do you understand that? You know, we're scared about something that, hey, it's going to happen. It's in God's hands when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. You know, Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. Um, Adam's name means man. Seth's name means appointed. Enosh's name means mortal. Verse 7 and 8, And he begot Enosh. Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. There it is again. We're going to read that nine times in this passage. And Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And after he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 800 years, 815 years, and had sons and daughters. Only one escapes this death thing. We're going to read about him. You know, but imagine having a lifespan that's something like 900 years. You know, we talked about this in the creation, how there may have been a, this vapor canopy around the world, you know, there, a water canopy out there. It filters out all the harmful UV rays and ultraviolet rays and X-rays and all of this stuff. And so life was this extended period of time. And, uh, you know, scientists today look at the human heart and they go, the human heart is capable of beating for, for upwards of 500 years. 500 years if it didn't get polluted, if it didn't have the cholesterol, if it didn't have to endure with the stress and you know the hardship and, and all of that stuff we deal with today. And when Christ returns, we find out that in the millennial kingdom, it goes back to a longevity life. It, you know, a child will die at 100 years old in the millennial kingdom. So, you know, imagine what the learning curve was like back then. You know, we have a very short learning curve. Our little kids learn how to talk in three years by watching us, listening to us, right? So they, they learn this idiomatic language by practice and by ob observation. But imagine what it would be like to live 900 years. What were your terrible twos like? And, and when did they happen? Maybe it was in your 50s. That was your terrible twos, you know? <laughs> Kids out of control, you know, he's just doing everything. And, and what would it be like, you know, I've always wanted to, like, speak another language. Well, I'll do that next century, you know. I, I'm going to set aside 50 years and just learn another language, you know. I've always wanted to memorize this book in the Bible. Well, if you just memorize a verse a week, you'll memorize the whole Bible in your lifetime. Easily, easily. All of these things that you could learn, that you could pick up, that you could just hang on to, if you just had that much time, now the trouble is, you know, we'd be watching TV for 25 years at a time, you know? <laughs> anyway, imagine the craftsmen that were out there. These guys who had been learning to carve or learning to play instruments or learning to do whatever the crafty thing was, some of these guys have been doing that for 400 years, 500 years. Imagine the wisdom they would have by doing that, you know? I mean, wouldn't you love to learn from a real master? Oh, don't use that piece of wood. What? Well, I can see it from here, you know? It's just, you know, and you're like, oh. <laughs> I'd have never thought about that. Here it is, you know. So, all this thing had longevity. Even dinosaurs had this longevity. Where did dinosaurs come from? You hear it all the time. You ever see a dinosaur egg when they find them? They're like an ostrich egg. They're like this big. You would expect the egg of a Brontosaurus to be about 14 feet long, right? I mean, you would expect this big old thing. They find these little things. Why? because they just grow continually, right? Reptiles never stop growing. You know, when we were in Australia, we saw a five meter croc, a five meter croc.
crock. You know, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 15 foot long crock. Yeah, his head was the size of my love seat at home. Just his head. Jeez. And, and they teased him with something and he, he brought his head out of the water and opened his mouth and I could have just, I could have just slid right in there, you know? Imagine, you know, they say he's like 75 years old or something. Imagine if he was 400 years old. How big would he be? I don't have a clue, you know? <sighs> anyway, back to our story. Verse 9, Enoch lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 800 years, 815 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and begat Mahaliel. And after he begat Mahaliel, he lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Canaan is a tough translation. It's one of two words, one of two names in this section that you can struggle with. You're looking them up. You're, you're trying all the sources to figure out what this is. Some think it means sorrow. It can mean to nest or to take a position. Mahaliel, his son, means to praise God or to bless God. The L on the end gives it away. It's, it's, it's something to do with God, you know. Verse 15, Mahaliel lived 65 years and begot Jared, and he ate at Subway the rest of his life. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's a different guy. And after he begot Jared, Mahaliel lived 830 years and he had sons and daughters, so all the days of Mahaliel were 895 years, and he died. You know, Jared means to descend or to come down, to lose weight. <laughs> no, no, not that. Um, and Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. And Enoch, and after he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years, had sons and daughters, and all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And death is about to take a break. Jared means to come down to ascend. Enoch dies. And then we get into this interesting story. And Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And he began, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Interesting, right? Just 365 years. That's way shorter than everybody else. But notice this. And he was not, for God took him. What? I want so much more information here. Wait a minute. <laughs> What's going on here? So Methuselah, his name means his death shall bring. Now, it's interesting, and Enoch walks with God after he has Methuselah, after the birth of this son. Something about God ever, evidently talking to Methuselah lay upon his heart, when your son passes, I'm going to bring about some stuff. I don't know if he told him the whole story, if he just knows when he dies, this is going to happen, I don't know, but he names him. Man, when I die, this is going to happen. Imagine God telling you, I'm going to forestall my judgment until your son dies. Can you imagine how carefully you'd be watching that son? You know, he's out there playing on the street. You're like, no, no, get on. You know, you, he, he gets the common cold and it's reason to be terrified, you know. The beautiful thing is that this son, Methuselah, will live the longest recorded life in history. You know, 969 years. That's God's grace. That's God's long suffering. He doesn't want to bring judgment. 
But something after the birth of the son and, and God explaining to him that, hey, his death is going to bring, something begins to cook between Enoch and God. And they start to hang out. He begins to walk with God. <laughs> this is like the first mention of walking with God since Adam did it. Here's a guy that actually is walking with God. We know he was a preacher. We're told he was a prophet in the book of Jude. Jude 1.14 says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all and to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in ungodly ways and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Sounds like great days to live in, doesn't it? There's ungodliness all over the place. Verse 23. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. God took him. He walks with God for 300 years. I guess I have just only begun to walk with God. Right? I got like 25 years going. <laughs> Woohoo! 25 years, me and Jesus, you know? 300 years. What, what would that be like? And it says God took him. God seized him. God snatches him away. He is one of only two people that do not die in the Bible. You remember the story of Elijah and how he's caught up in the fiery chariot, you know? But it gives us this interesting picture. Jesus told us that when the Son of Man returns, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. And in this picture, we find three groups of individuals. We find those who are going to be judged by the flood, right? Those just regular old people going about their lives, ignoring God, not seeking Him, just going about life. Then we're going to find a group of people that are going to be spared through the flood. Noah, his three sons, their wives. Those are going to be spared through the flood by riding along in the ark, right? But then we have this one who is, who is um, taken out before the judgment. Enoch. He's spared the judgment because he's taken out. We have the same three groups of people in the world today. We have the masses who are just living life, the Christ rejectors. I don't need that. I'm a good person. I do what I want to do. Me and God will have a discussion when we get up there and he'll let me in, you know? You have the, the true Jews who are going to be supernaturally kept through the coming judgment, through the Great Tribulation. Read about those in Revelation, a couple other places. And there are those who will be taken out before that judgment happens because they were walking with God. But Mark, <laughs> your picture doesn't make any sense because Enoch was just one guy. One guy. You're, you're telling me the whole church is going to disappear in a moment, going to be caught up to God. He's going to snatch us off the planet because we were walking with him, but your picture fails because Enoch was just one body. You know? Can I, can I tell you something? The church is one body. We're the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We are one body. <laughs> This man, Enoch, takes away all of our excuses. We're going to read about his days, and the earth is filled with violence, filled with immorality, with perversion, with false worship. At this point, God looks at the earth and he says, every thought 
and intent of man's heart is evil continually. Are we at that stage? We're, we're quite close to that stage. I don't know if we're quite there, but maybe. But this man, Enoch, he made a choice to walk with God in those days. And if he could do it, church, <laughs> if he could do it without the New Testament, if he could do it without the Holy Spirit indwelling him, if he could do it without being born again, right? then you and I can do it. We can live that way. We can make that choice. Enoch had this real sense that things were not going to continue the way they were continuing. It's coming to an end. I sense judgment is coming. Even prophesies about that. I see the Lord returning. Ten thousands of his saints. You know, he goes through that whole thing. Do you have that sense? Do you look at the world and go, man, I, I don't think it's going to continue this direction. I feel like the Lord could come back at any time. I feel like, man, I need to wake up. I need to get back. I need to get on it, you know. Hebrews 11.5, it says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was found, was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. <laughs> I want that to be my testimony. I'm not sure that's my testimony. I want that to be my testimony. He believed God. He walked with God. And that pleased God. Hebrews 11.6 is one of my memory verses. It says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's where I want to be found. I want to be found knowing God, experiencing God, living with God, walking with God, and expecting God to do what His promises tell me He's going to do. That's where I want to be. Back to verse 25. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. And after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. 969 years old. He has Lamech. And Lamech is another tr tough translation word. Powerful or afflicted. It's hard to be dom dogmatic about what that name actually means. And the reason I'm telling you all these names is because we're going to write a sentence when we're done with these names. So Methuselah, 969 years. 969 years, he dies, the flood comes. The flood comes. <laughs> he's the oldest recorded life in the Bible and he is a guy who worked on the ark with Noah can you imagine this old guy 900 and whatever years old and he's helping me out Noah let me let me climb up that scaffolding and get that you know we came home the other day and my, my father in law is like 80 years old and he's up on the top of his his uh, fifth wheel doing something and we get there and my wife goes, will you get my father down off of that fifth wheel? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, honey. You know, he should not, 80-year-old guy should not be up there. You can imagine Methuselah. And you know what his name means. When he dies, when he falls off of there, judgment's coming. We're not quite ready. Um, can we help you down? Can, why don't you just stand this piece over here? You know? It's, so, Lamech lives 182 years and has a son, and he calls his name Noah. This one will comfort us concerning our work and toil, which our hands, work and toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord cursed. 
Adam lives 55 years into Lamech's life. He has this child like 35 years later called Noah. Comfort. He's going to bring comfort. Don't you love that? Because of the ground which the Lord God has cursed. That phrase takes you all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Who would have told Lamech about God cursing the ground? Noah. Or Adam. Adam would have told him that. Man has sinned, you know. Adam has sinned. We've all fallen. But there's a line. There's a Messiah coming. There's a promised one coming. And in that line, your son's in that line. You're in that line. And your son, you know. And after he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years. That's an interesting number. Life cut short by the flood. He dies right before the flood, apparently. God's mercy to him. And Noah lived 500 years, and Noah begat Sham, Ham, and Japheth. Noah doesn't have kids until he's 500 years old. Is that because he knows judgment's coming? Is he looking out there going, there? I don't, I don't want to have kids and lead them into this thing. I, I don't want to do that. Can I just tell you, I think that's a wrong approach. This next generation needs godly kids in it. They need godly seed. You know? They need influencers for Christ. Just like our generation needed them, you know? Jesus has told us to occupy until I come. <laughs> but some generation is going to get interrupted. You know it's going to happen, right? And we never really think about this. You know, somebody, somebody is just going to be finishing up becoming a doctor. Seven years of medical school, all of this training, got straight A's, I've been attending, I've been sticking my nose in the books. I, you know, it's graduation day, he's just about to get his doctorate. The trumpet blows, we're out of here. Wait, wait a minute, you know? Or, or the couple that's, that's been pure. They've saved themselves for each other and it's the wedding night and they just say their ideas and man, they're so excited and they're in the car on the way to the place. Da -da -da -da! Trumpet blows. Some guy like Mark's going to be right in the middle of an old car. Just putting on the final touches, you know, polishing the last little piece of chrome and putting this thing back on there. Just got this baby going. It's going to be so... Da -da -da -da. Yeah. And can I tell you that when we get there, not one of us will be disappointed. Not a single one of us. Because of the glory of that place compared to this place. No regrets. You know, it's going to happen to somebody. So somewhere along the line, Noah gets the instruction to build the ark and he goes, man, I need some helpers, you know. Not, you know, old Methuselah over there is going to kill himself doing this. I, I need some. And so he has these three sons. Now we've looked at this messianic line. And it's very interesting. Yes, we have two names that are a struggle. I get it. But Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Mahaliel means the blessed God. Jared, to descend or to come down. Enoch, teaching. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Lamech, probably afflicted. And Noah means comfort. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God will come down, teaching that his death shall bring comfort. 
shall bring the afflicted in comfort. Sorry, I left that name out. Our God who controls everything. Their kids named, their parents named these kids. God was behind even the names of the kids. Satan sees that story and he can't let that story be written. And so he tries to intervene. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty Years. That's not and that's not saying they're they're going to live 120 years. That that says I'm going to put up with them for 120 years. I'm going to bring judgment. The flood's going to come in 120 years. And there were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore their children to them, and they were mighty men, who were of old men of renown. This is one of those passages that I wish I had a lot more information than I do. It came to pass when the sons of God saw the daughters of men. The word for men is Adam. When the sons of Adam, or the daughters of Adam, it is here, right? because it's the sons of God. They saw them, they took, and in that word they took is a force, is violence even. They, these sons of God, took for themselves these beautiful women, whoever they wanted. And there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. In those days, pre-flood and also after the flood. Because these sons of God went into the daughters of men, the daughters of Adam, and produced this offspring of Nephilim, giants. Two basic ideas thought about here. Some say there is a righteous line of Seth. And uh, they say that Cain's daughters, they're the Canaanitish women, you know. And instead of remaining separate, they compromise with each other. Here's these sons of God, the, the righteous line of Seth. And they go into the Canaanitish women. And they produce some abnormal birth things and their tyrants are born unto them. I got a handful of problems with that. The first one is what is a righteous line of Seth? No such mention of it. There's there's no clue about it. The Bible is never mentions it. Doesn't have anything that knows nothing of it. We know that Seth was created in Adam's image, that fallen image. He's a sinner. There is no righteous life of Seth. We know there's a messianic line. The messianic line is interesting, right? Because in that messianic line is, is people like Rahab, the harlot. In that messianic line is David, the adulterer and murderer. In that messianic line is Abraham, the liar, you know? <laughs> the guy who used to worship idols. So what is being said here? Ancient scholars, guys from past generations, Hall Hebrew scholars, study this phrase, the sons of God. Beneo Elohim. Bene Elohim. In the Hebrew. It's used three other times in the Bible, all in the book of Job. 
Job 1.6, Job 2.1, Job 38.7, and it speaks of angels. In the Septuagint, the, the Greek rendering of the Old Testament Hebrew that was done 280 years before Jesus, it translates this passage, the angels of God went into the daughters of men. Because the daughters of men here are the daughters of Adam. Kyle and Delich, these Hebrew scholars, word scholars, said if you exegete the language precisely, it says the angels of God go into the daughters of men. We have a couple of, of um, close relatives of these words. Um, in Daniel, as, as Nebuchadnezzar is looking into the fiery furnace, he's just thrown the three Hebrew boys in there, and he says, there's a fourth personage in there like the Son of God, bar, bar Elohim, like the Son of God, he's seeing a divine person in there, angelic being perhaps in there. Twice in the Psalms it says, B'nai Elohim, it's Psalm 29.1 and Psalm uh, 89.6, that also speaks of angels. So as men begin to multiply on the earth, mankind in general, humankind, all this downline of Adam begins to, you know, multiply, we are faced with this very strange idea that the sons of God, angels, going into the daughters of men, taking whomever they want, and spawning giants, tyrants. Hmm. Philavius Josephus, in his writings, he was a uh, historian in the days of Jesus, approximately those days. He tells us that these are fallen angels. And they took women, whomever they desired, and that their offspring were giants, Nephilim. Then he says, this description describes what the Greeks talk about in their demigods. You ever study Greek culture? And the, you know, the gods came down and had sex with humans and they, they spawned these half-god, you know, Hercules and you know, all of these kind of things. So that Greek mythology may not be all mythology. Interesting idea. Then he goes on to tell us that the bones of these giants are still around to his day for everyone to go and examine. In, day, in Christ's day, you could still examine the, the bones of these giants. Now, what's interesting is there's still plenty of giant bones around to discover. Hundreds of them found in the Americas. You know, the Indian culture has this tradition that there were giants trying to reign and rule over them, and, and they denied the Great Spirit. That's what they call God. They denied the Great Spirit. They mocked the Great Spirit. And so the Great Spirit sent a flood, and he drove them up to the hills. And that wasn't enough, so he drove them up to the mountains, and that wasn't enough, so he covered the mountains with a flood and destroyed them. Many of the early church fathers, you know, Phileo, Justin Martyr, Aeneas, Apergurus, Tertullian, Amorous, Julian, they all say these are fallen angels who are doing this. Something evil, something ma malevolent is going on here. They're trying to stop the, the messianic line, the pure line. They're trying to infect it, invade it, stop it any way they can, pollute it, you know. It tells us plainly 
They were there in the days of the flood, before the days of the flood, and also afterwards. You've got to think about that. How did they get there afterwards? Because all human flesh was destroyed in the flood except Noah and the three boys and their wives, right? Only those people got off the boat. That's what God started over with. How did, how did the Nephilim get back on the earth after that? Because angels came down and did it again. You know, just Genesis 6, 9 says this. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Was not infected, was not inbred, had none of this in his generations. His boys didn't have it. He didn't have it. It didn't get past that way beyond the flood. So verse 4, <clears throat> this word giants, Nephilim, bullies, tyrants, giants. As you read through the Bible, you're going to find out that, that in, in the Old Testament, you're going to read about the Rephaim, about the Ema, about the Aven, about the Horns, about the Zamzumo. They are my favorite. Zamzumo. You know, you, you're sneaking around, and you walk up over a hillside, and you look down, and you go, Zoom! Zoom! There's giants down there. I'm out of here. You know? And, <laughs> sorry. And then the Anakin. Those are all tribes of giants. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 3. You read about Israel going into the land. Do you remember that? And on their way there, they get to uh, Basham, the, this country of Basham. And Og, king of Bashan, is there. And he has 60 cities of giants. 60 cities of them. Deuteronomy 3.11 For only Gog, Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnants of the giants. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. Nine cubits in length, four cubits in width. This guy's bedstead was 13 and a half feet long and six feet wide. That's a king size bed. You know, that's a king size bed. That's a very big giant. 13 feet tall. 13 feet. Can you imagine Shaq? Shaquille O'Neal, twice his size. Twice his size. That's a big boy. How about Andre the Giant? You're an old wrestling fan? He was a big man. Can you imagine that guy? Twice his size? The one David took out with this look. He was just nine feet. He's just a baby giant. He's just a baby, you know? They have found in Bashan basalt houses with 18 foot tall ceilings, all made out of these basalt slabs. And, and people look at them and go, how did they build these things? How they They have basalt doors that still swing on iron hinges. You can still move them. <laughs> they have found these huge structures in the Baca Valley. And the floor pieces, just the pieces for the floors, are the size of box cars. And we don't know how they got them there, how they put them in place. You remember Christ on the cross? You read, you read uh, Psalm 22, and it says in Psalm 22, verse 12, "Many bowls have surrounded me; strong bowls of Bashan have encircled me." You don't see that in the Gospels in Golgotha because this is the spiritual view. This is the literal view. There's, there's stuff going on there. These bulls of Bashan, they're the ones that sired that giant, the giants on the earth. 
They're surrounding him. They think they have him right where they want him. They're about to get victory over him. It says their, their mouths are gaping open like a lion's mouths. Ha <laughs> ha! We're killing the Christ. He can do nothing about it. We've got this. The argument against what I'm telling you is, is the, the Bible scholars will take you to Matthew 22, verse 23. And it says, And the same day the Sadducees came, who say there is no resurrection, and they came to Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies and has no children, his brother should go into that wife and sire children for him and, you know, pass on the thing. Well, there was this guy, and he, he had seven children, and the first one got married to this woman, and she turned out to be a black widow, and he died before they had kids. And then the second one, and he died, and the third one, and he died. And if I'm the fourth one, I'm running for my life because I'm not going to marry her, you know. And all the way to the seventh, and the seventh had her, and they had no children, and then they all died, and they go to heaven. Who then, you know, is going to be the wife because, you know, they all have it. And he says, are you not greatly mistaken? Not knowing the power of God, nor the word of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. And they want to tell you that angels don't marry. They can't do this. What Jesus just told us was the angels of God in heaven do not do this. He doesn't say anything about fallen angels in this passage. When you read Peter and when you read Jude, they were there when Jesus preached what he preached, but they know a little something that some people don't know. In 2 Peter 2.4 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and it's, a, it's an interesting word for hell, it's the word Tartarus. It's the only use of it in the whole Bible. There is a special holding place for the angels who did what he's about to describe they did. For if he did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness and reserved them for your judgment and did not spare the ancient world but saved Noah. Notice he links the days of Noah with these angels who sinned. Interesting. There's more information in Peter 3, 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20. Jude 1, it says this, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, their first estate, did not keep the principality that God had placed them in and with, but left their own abode. They left the place where they dwell, and it's in the aorist tense, they left it once and for all, never to return to it. He has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness for judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner, and he's referring us back to these angels that fell, and then he takes us to Sodom and Gomorrah. The same thing was happening over here in Sodom and Gomorrah. What was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah? Oh yeah, to those having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Strange flesh. He set them forth in his example, suffering vengeance of eternal fire. Jude tells us that these fallen angels sinned in the very same way that Sodom and Gomorrah was sinning, going after strange flesh. He says God has reserved them for judgment. So Peter and Jude, both with great understanding of Jesus' teachings and what's going on, do not hesitate to say that these fallen angels in Noah's day were doing something strange, right? Going after strange flesh. So when Jesus tells us that in the last days it's going to be like the days of Noah, what does that make you think about? What does that make you think about? I'm kind of glad I'm going to get raptured and get out of here. Just, just the way I think. 
just the way I am. We're told in Thessalonians that the Holy Spirit is right now restraining. Restraining stuff from this world. But if he's restraining evil, he's not doing a very good job. If he's restraining, you know, violence or abortion or political unrest or, you know, if he's just restraining this worldly stuff, man, he's not very powerful. What if he's restraining something much darker, much more, you know, malevolent than that? And he's going to restrain it until the church is taken out. What a dark day the next day is going to be here. What a dark day. Isaiah 13, 2. Interesting passage. It says, Lift up a banner on the high mountain. Raise your voice to them. Wave your hand that they may enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, those who rejoice in my exaltation. Sounds like just a kind of a regular verse. The Septuagint translators, those, those uh, 70 Hebrew and Greek scholars that translated the word of God into Greek before the time of Jesus says this lift up a standard on the mountain the plain exalt the voice of them beckon with the hand to open the gates you rulers I give command I bring them giants are coming to fulfill my wrath rejoicing at the same time and insulting that changes that verse quite dramatically Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. You can also find that idea in Job. When God announces through his genealogy that the righteous God will come down and bring comfort to the afflicted man, Satan and his fallen angels attack that with everything they have. We cannot allow that to happen, otherwise we're going to lose. So I got news for you guys, you're going to lose. Trying to ruin the perfect lineage. What do we find out about Noah? His generations are perfect. 1 Peter 3.19 By whom also... He went and preached to the spirits in prison, Jesus, after his resurrection. He goes and preaches to the spirits in prison. This is not evangelizing. He's not preaching the gospel there. He's making a victory proclamation to these spirits. These are not the souls of fallen men. These are the imprisoned spirits that God put in Tartarus held who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight souls were saved through water Jesus descends to some place where these angels these beings are being held and he doesn't preach gospel to them he tells them I am have won. You have lost. <laughs> the cross did not defeat me, it defeated you. And that must have taken place somewhere between the resurrection and his ascension. Christ goes right to these rebels, right to these rebellious, prideful, angels and proclaims his victory your plan has failed I have stopped it through my blood 
from Cain killing Abel, to this outbreak before the flood, to Pharaoh killing all of the firstborn males or killing all of the male children, to the giants in the land when Israel moves in the land. You remember? You remember they sent in the 12 spies? And 10 of them come back up. They're giants in there. We don't want to go. Let's not go. We were like grasshoppers in their sight. Oh, they were back in those days too? Yes. No wonder God comes and he says, we must wipe out all the inhabitants of Canaan. Is there a perfect bloodline in there? What's in there? Don't have a clue. All the things we don't know. We're going to have to stop there. I pray that you would think about this passage. Now, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just not saying I'm wrong. <laughs> you have choice. You have a brain. I was lucky to get out of high school. You know? Don't take my word for it. What does the Word of God say? The only way to know that is to ask the writer of the Word of God to come in and give me wisdom about this. Show me what this is. Lord, lead me through that. You know, it's so much better than to just read a book to to know the author and have him talk you through the book. That's so much better. What did you mean here? Why did you word it like that? You know? And he will talk to you. He will speak to you. These Nephilim giants. It seems like there's going to be a return. You know, I think about that. Xerxes, you know, when you read through uh, the Old Testament and you read through uh, Esther, the story of Esther, and her husband, Xerxes, the king of Greece. He was a giant. He was a giant. You know, some say he was 10, 12 feet tall. Interesting ideas. Yeah, if you've ever watched the movie The 300, I don't suggest it. <laughs> it's one more yucky. Bleh. Look at it. But they show him as a giant. You know? And I'm like, I never put that in my brain. You know? Very, very cool stuff. And anyway, on we go. Lord, uh, you've heard us today. Lord, I'm so glad you've chosen to come and be long-suffering and faithful and gracious to us. And God, that you've put out the proclamation that you will forgive all manner of sin. All manner. Murder, rape, child abuse, lying, cheating, stealing, even rejecting you and rejecting you for years if we'll but turn and come to you in faith. And God, I pray, God, that you would turn to you. God, that they would come. And then, God, that you would anoint them with your Holy Spirit, open their eyes, give them a desire to get into your word and learn the truth. And Lord, be moved in that towards you. God, we give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.